Better. Okay. Um, we're so happy uh, at CPHA to have been invited today to talk about um, our perspective uh, and where do pharmacists fit in this whole equation as uh, we believe um, medication experts and licensed uh, regulated healthcare professionals as well in this, in this triad of this group that we've been uh, talking about this afternoon. Um, so I represent, I, I'm a practicing pharmacist as well. I've had a background mostly in hospital pharmacy, starting my career in critical care, but working since the age of nine at my dad's community pharmacy, and then everything in between, lots of leadership roles, and now um, it's my privilege to be able to represent um, my 42,000 colleagues across the country who work in uh, community practice, hospital practice, long-term care, et cetera. Can I just see, I'm really interested to know that there's so many physicians in the room, there's 9% of the delegation is nursing, which is fantastic. How many pharmacists do we have in the room, show of hands? Okay, so just in case I need to call in the troops, that's great. Um, no, just really happy to see the level of engagement of pharmacists in this very important conversation. Um, so our focus at CPHA is really um, on the pursuit and support of pharmacists, um, delivering excellence in patient care um, in, in the overall healthcare system. Um, and, and I'm here representing pharmacists who, who work in every single touch point of healthcare across this country. Um, what I'm going to try to do today uh, in the short time that I have is to give you a little bit of an overview and a reminder of the role of the pharmacist uh, in this space and the implications for us and the implications that we can offer as healthcare professionals to patients in the use of medical cannabis, focusing mostly on the medical stream. Um, I'm going to try to um, review a little bit of the background behind the six recommendations that CPHA submitted to the Health Committee uh, with respect to medical cannabis, and I'm going to try to identify what we think are other opportunities opportunities for pharmacists in this space um, with respect to cannabis and the role of the pharmacist. So every day, um, I and all of my colleagues act as medication stewards on behalf of Canadians. How many of you have a pharmacist that you have a relationship with in your community? Good, I, I see a good show of hands. Um, we make sure, um, we don't just fill medications, we make sure that patients' medications and dosages are right for them. We identify drug-related problems, both actual and potential. We work with patients every day to make sure that they understand their drug therapy. We address adverse effects, we talk about patients' progress, we monitor their outcomes. We're also the most accessible healthcare professional. We're very proud of that. We're uh, across the country in 10,000 pharmacies in urban, rural, and remote settings, and often the only healthcare hub in a community. So we have those relationships and those regular and frequent touch points with patients, and often, and particularly in patients with chronic disease, for which medical cannabis is often a treatment option for, we have multiple more touch points with patients than any other healthcare provider. Um, and lots of public opinion, public opinion polls, excuse me, out, out there say that patients, when they think about their medication, and I think most of you in this room feel that cannabis for medical reasons is a medication, they think about their pharmacist. Um, so we try to enable our pharmacists to practice to their full potential, making them even more accessible to patients and offering the expertise uh, therein. Um, we know that now, and we've heard this throughout the day, more than 235, I think, registered patients now with licensed producers are here in the country, and it was really interesting to hear that some of that survey data this morning. We've seen more and more people using medical cannabis for over the last decade or so, and there's surveys, and I, I think that Jeff talked about the recent Canadian Family Physician um, Systematic Review and Guidelines. They talked about the fact that 70% or more of patients believe that, that the use of medical cannabis um, does result in moderate or better improvement uh, of symptoms. And I really like what Jonathan said this morning about this is really about a patient-centered conversation balanced with evidence. And this is kind of the perspective that we see it as, as pharmacists. Um, so with that, patient experience, we of course as healthcare professionals have to balance that with a very healthy skepticism based on what some of us think is a lack of or limited evidence in this whole area. Um, the reality for us as pharmacists um, is that we're approached by patients daily, we're approach, approached by prescribers daily as the drug information or medication experts, um, I need to talk to my pharmacist about this because I'm taking this for a legitimate uh, disease state condition that I have. Um, pharmacists are really well positioned to manage or track and monitor controlled substances every day, recognizing that changes will come with the new legislation. We're already set up to monitor narcotics, controlled drugs. Um, we have a framework for that. Um, there isn't 
a current opportunity right now to include consultation and oversight from the medication experts as the, at the point of dispensing. So again, to us, this is this is really um, this is really a patient safety conversation. These therapies are often, as others have said, third or fourth line adjunctive therapies to an already existing traditional medication regimen. With that comes drug interactions. Heard some comments about anticholinergic burden this morning. We're seeing older patients using these medications. Um, they need the oversight, we believe, and we believe that the pharmacist is missing from the equation. So in terms of the CPHA recommendations, our recommendations specifically, um, you may be aware that initially we were actually aligned with the CMA back in 2013. Um, our position statement initially was quite similar to the CMA's position statement, but we recognize now that the landscape has changed significantly, um, and as we've said, many more patients using these, these medications, and they're going to use them anyway. So we can't look the other way as the medication experts, and we have to um, keep in mind that we have also um, a duty to protect the safety, health safety, medication safety of the patients that we provide care to. So our current recommendations were informed by those that growing concern among our own profession about the lack of clinical oversight um, in the dispensing area of, of, of medical cannabis um, and what that involves. Um, our, our recommendations included consultation from pharmacists um, were informed by the task force recommendations, um, an independent report, and as well public opinion polling. And again, you know, um, patients want to be able to access their cannabis from their pharmacist. They're, um, you know, and to speak to Jonathan's point earlier about having perhaps, you know, a, a little bit of a double-tiered um, stream where distribution and dispensing are, are separate activities um, or not, um, the pharmacist clearly needs to be part of the equation even from the patient perspective. Um, so these are our six recommendations that we actually took to the health committee, and I'll go through each of them individually in terms of their basis. Um, uh, but again, I, I've already told you what they've been informed by. So in terms that we like the CNA and, and now unlike the CMA, do believe that there should be two distinct, two distinct streams. Um, I think we've talked about the unique needs of medical patients, why they're, they can be vulnerable. We're happy that for now the intent to follow and maintain these two streams is, is, is part of the plan, but we are concerned that there are shortcomings in the medical stream, and, and I've already discussed that in terms of not having um, that other uh, healthcare professional involved in oversight, um, and 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 you know respecting also the the um, dominant view of the patients from a harm reduction perspective and a patient safety perspective. Um, these are psychoactive substances. We believe that we have lots to learn from things like the opioid crisis. I don't believe personally that this is exactly the same analogy to alcohol. There are lots and lots of intricate and complex interactions within this whole space that we don't understand yet. So I, I'm not sure that I can totally um, prescribe to that, no pun intended, analogy a, as yet. Um, we're, also, um, we're also conscious of the fact that having two distinct streams could protect the supply chain. As a pharmacist, um, both in hospital and community settings, I've lived in a world of drug shortages now that have been a really bad reality for probably five to seven years. So what are we going to do to protect the supply chain for those vulnerable patients who, again, may respond to only a specific strain? Somebody like Jonathan or one of his colleagues or friends um, uh, uh, who has the same issue, uh, we need to think about that as well. Um, we also feel like having two distinct streams will lead to more systemic benefits and will lead to uh, potentially a more robust evidence base that we all, I think, agree that we clearly need. Um, so in terms of supporting um, and including pharmacists, just a little bit more around the management and dispensing of medical cannabis. Um, I heard, you know, it was interesting this morning um, when our medical regulator colleagues talked about dispensing. Well, who should be dispensing? Physicians shouldn't be dispensing cannabis for medical purposes. Who should be dispensing cannabis for medical purposes? We feel that it should be pharmacists. Dispensing is an act that is not just pouring pills from one bottle to another bottle. It has 
technical functions, but obviously very important cognitive functions as well. And pharmacists have that unique education and expertise to dispense medications and do everything that that involves in a patient-centered environment, including that discussion around adverse effects and drug interactions and appropriate use. And doing that within the context, not just talking about the benefits and harms of cannabis, cannabis alone, but by ha having pharmacists more involved, they're able to have that conversation because they have that medication profile now in front of them, and they can have that conversation not in a silo, but in the context of every other medication that patient is taking, potentially from multiple prescribers. Um, so pharmacists already do a lot of that um, care management, case management type of work kind of being the glue between multiple prescribers and lots of patient confusion. So imagine um, adding cannabis to this armamentarium and, uh, and you know, allowing pharmacists to, to really be those collaborators to the physicians and nurses who clearly are telling us today um, that they need those extra resources and we need to work together as a team and not one person has the answer. So I think from the expertise and the access that I've already talked about, um, this is really part of you know, the conversation that we want to have. And for those of you who may be skeptical that pharmacists have a commercial interest in this, um, most pharmacists are employees of, salaried employees of either pharmacies, hospitals, other environments, and just like physicians and nurses, they, I, have to follow a code of ethics, beneficence and non-maleficence from our own colleges, um, and, um, our, and we pledge to make the patient our primary concern. But I certainly know those concerns are out there. Um, in terms of, you know, uh, pharmacists dispensing, what do pharmacists feel that they want to do? Well, you know, and I've already alluded to this earlier, but we have done surveying that shows that pharmacists do believe that they have a role in dispensing medical cannabis as a part of um, that whole con you know, context of an entire of a patient's an entire drug therapy regimen. Um, what are our colleagues are telling us, and I, and I will address some of the things that we've done, and I've heard a lot of this in the Q&A, is just like every other healthcare professional, their discomfort lies in their education. Um, I did seven years of, you know, five years of pharmacy school, two years of a doctor of pharmacy, didn't learn anything about the endocannabinoid system, had to teach it at Waterloo a few months ago. Now, I went to school in the 90s, full disclosure, but most of you are telling me that that's still not happening for my physician and nursing, and not for my pharmacy, for, not from the pharmacy curricula as well, though that's evolving. It's still an elective class that I was asked to come in and teach last fall. So um, we need to look at professional development, which we're doing at CPHA, um, and get rid of some of that discomfort, which really underlies um, a lot of the paralysis, I think, in, in accepting this. So, and then of course the regula regulatory approaches and um, you know, we, of course, we are not the pharmacy regulator. We are the advocacy, the National Advocacy Association. Of course, we have to work with NAPRA and the other 10 provincial pharmacy regulators across the country, but, but hope that there will be um, some, some conversation now around uh, putting together either um, a national or a provincially associated um, regulatory process to amend the ACMPR to include pharmacist dispensing as part of this equation. Um, there's some conversation around health, um, health products containing cannabis, which I personally still don't know a lot about, but I think fundamentally also we believe that, you know, any, any health product that contains cannabis um, would ideally be, be placed in a pharmacy and, and um, you know, permit that conversation with a pharmacist um, uh, so that they can have that discussion with the patient around safety. Um, just like everybody else, uh, we feel that there is not enough research out there. Um, we really, I, I appreciate the comments about offline prescribing. I appreciate Jeff's counter to that. I think all good points, um, you know, gabapentin, pediatric, those are all, uh, yes, approved drugs through our regulatory process through Health Canada. Um, most over-the-counter medications don't have a lot of evidence behind them. And not to mention the lack of evidence with respect to opioids themselves. Like how many head-to-head -head comparisons do we have with opioid and non-opioid analgesics out there? So um, there is lots of lack of evidence in, in products that we use uh, every day. Um, and we recognize that you know um, there are limited there's limited evidence and there's limitations to the evidence. Um, others have talked and will talk about um, the challenges with some of the the data that we have now, um, the lack of 
placebo control, trials of short duration, et cetera. And, and again, to speak to that CFP paper that came out just last month, which they did say the, the, the only real consistent evidence we feel that we have is in the harms and adverse effects. So then why, why look the other way? Then why not have a harm reduction approach and ensure that there's clinical oversight from every regulated healthcare professional who can contribute to the care of our patients? in this area. Um, so, so we feel that, again, having two streams um, will also help facilitate some of the research that we want to do. And, and we feel that having pharmacists involved um, and the infrastructure that comes with that um, and the pharmacovigilance that could be offered could build a, a, a data towards a more robust evidence base. Um, one, of the, one of the things, and I think somebody talked about it this morning, that we also um, I get a little bit frustrated about is that since the government did announce its intention to legalize marijuana, we've seen quite a proliferation of these so-called dispensaries across the country that claim to sell medical cannabis. And because it's legal in Canada, many Canadians believe that they're getting a medical product. And the use of the term dispensary, which is synonymous in Canada with pharmacy, is very confusing to patients and can compound this misconception for them. Um, so we at CPHA and even our national regulatory body really urges against allowing distribution sites to use these terms like dispensary or pharmacy-related symbols like the green crosses. They can just promote the notion that recreational uh, marijuana has actual health benefits and can be challenging for patients. Um, so we would really like to see those terms be completely restricted. Um, others have talked about this and have more expertise than I do in this area, but again, like others have said, um, just to reinforce, again, to support the integrity of the, the, the uh, medical stream once recreational cannabis is legal, we have to ensure that patients have access to the respective streams, and we all know that cost can be a driver in how Canadians access their uh, medical cannabis or their medication. Um, so we think that that really needs to be considered. Um, as others have said, there is now some limited coverage with some insurance providers, um, but we are concerned about the risk of diverting some of these really vulnerable patients who are, again, um, using this as third or fourth line adjunctive or add-on therapy um, from, from getting the, the access to the medication that they need to because of cost um, and convenience issues and then not getting um, that clinical oversight that they need. Um, Again, others have already spoken much about this sort of um, public health, health promotion lens, and certainly CPHA also urges governments to regulate recreational cannabis through the lens of health promotion. Um, and, and, it, and just to reemphasize that we, and pharmacists have a big role in health promotion as well, and would embrace all of those strategies in terms of public education on the risks, um, product packaging containing warnings, um, behind-the-counter storage and restrictions and restrictions on advertising and mandatory training for some of the retail staff as well that's out there. Um, so uh, I feel like I'm talking really quickly, but maybe I'm towards the end of my talk. Am I good? Oh, Mark says I'm good. Okay. Okay, so uh, we've heard a lot today about... Um, we need tools, we need resources. So as this landscape evolves in Canada, and this is my particular wheelhouse at CPHA because I lead practice development and knowledge translation, um, I'm really proud of the fact that we have really addressed some of the concerns in our profession around we just don't have enough knowledge in this area. So we started last year by putting together just a simple FAQ document, which is on our website and actually accessible to anyone, just very commonly asked questions um, by frontline practitioners and patients to enable um, pharmacists and other health professionals with some, some basic tools on how to answer questions. These are generalists that don't practice in this area. How do you get started? We've now um, released two continuing education programs this year. Um, uh, through our governance structure, this is a member-only, unfortunately, CE program. We can we can certainly discuss it if you're interested in learning more about it. The first one is the Cannabis 101, and it's not like the one we got this morning, which takes me back to my MedChem class in 1990-something, but it is a really good primer to understand the basis of the endocannabinoid system. And the second program that we're very proud of, of takes a very, very critical look at the evidence to ensure that pharmacists and, and others really can filter through all of the data to help understand what they can start really looking at in part of their shared and evidence-based informed uh, 
um, discussions with their patients. Um, we recently released an evidence guide, and then the next day, the CFP systematic review came out, so I went into a little bit of a panic. But actually, we find that our, our piece is quite aligned. Um, ours is not a graded systematic review. It's just a curated summary of what we feel is the best evidence, and we go outside of primary care, recognizing that pharmacists get questions from neurologists whose patients, you know, um, are talking about use of this for, for Dravet's or Lennox just dose syndrome. So um, I would encourage all of you to look at our evidence guide. It's on our website. Let me know what you think about it. We're going through our next iteration next month, all done by a Waterloo Pharmacy student under my supervision. So really, really proud of, I think, what we've tried to do to arm um, our profession and others with the necessary tools um, and not use that anymore as a barrier or an excuse, but try to enable them to start to provide care because we just have to do it, and we all want to do it in an ev evidence-based fashion. Um, you may know that CPHA is also the, um, how many of you still have the blue book in your offices? We still are the publication house for the CPS and all of its iterations, um, and so we are actually um, almost... I think I want to say finished, but I'm not sure if I'll get in trouble for that. We have a cannabis monograph out now, um, just like uh, many of our other product monographs that we're so well known for also, to help healthcare providers make informed evidence-based decisions, and it is a very objective, as, as all our monographs are, look at the evidence. Um, so just in terms of some closing thoughts around this, I guess, um, you know, we're with our colleagues that this is a poorly understood area with an absent regulatory process behind approval as a drug. Um, does that mean it's not a drug? Um, I would say no. Um, I, I think that we feel, again, that this is a patient safety conversation. Um, we need, as pharmacists, we should be partners in that patient-focused framework. We are, uh, we are the right people to be partners in this. Um, and uh, this, is, this is happening, and, and we all want to help our patients, and um, I hope that we embrace the expertise and knowledge that we can all offer here um, for the sake of our patients. Thank you.